Welcome back to the Lobster Talks podcast by Lobster Capital, where we celebrate the bold thinkers and innovators driving change in the startup world. I'm your host, Gabriel Jarrison, and today I'm delighted to have Eduardo Lopez de Leon joining us. Eduardo is the co-founder and head of product at Coba, a fintech startup tackling the complexities of cross-border payments. Eduardo, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Gabriel, and hi to all the audience hearing the podcast. So we have a lot to uh, cover today, so let's just get started. To start simple, and then we'll dive in because we have a lot of things. Just tell us about yourself, please, and then tell us about Coba. Yeah, sure. So I'm Eduardo. I'm co-founder of Coba. My background is in computer science and technology. I'm originally from Monterrey, Mexico. That's where I studied computer science. And I started in the services business, especially in software development. I started working with some companies doing consulting. And between three friends and myself, we started a company that was basically focused on building and configuring software development teams out of Latin America to work with U.S. companies. That was 12 years ago. And I think that was kind of the school for things that we're building today in Cova. And that helped us a lot to realize what was the opportunity. And then we jumped into the fintech space because of many things that we were validating in the market. But yeah, originally from Mexico, right now based out of Austin, Texas, we were part of YC Summer 23 last year. We were based out of San Francisco back in person. But then, yeah, thanks so much. And we came back to Austin. That's just strategic, it's closer to Mexico in terms of cultural affinity, proximity, use cases that we can test. But yeah, that's a little bit about me. That's awesome. You chose Austin where everyone thinks or says that the gateway to Latin America is Miami. And so I understand why, you know, more to the east and closer, but why Austin and not Miami then? That's a great question. Yeah, I've heard the same from Colombian colleagues, Brazilian colleagues. I think Miami is it's uncomparable to other uh, cities in the U.S. in terms of the Latin American mix that you will find. And there are certainly many companies opening the regional headquarters based out of Miami, attending all the countries in South America, Latin America. But I think Austin, from my personal experience, since I'm from Monterey, which is two hours away from the border, I have family from Laredo, Texas originally. I used to come a lot to Austin. This is 10, 12 years ago. And there's a lot of people that were already talking about the tech scene and things that were happening there. And you have also this mix with, or let's say, like a balance between the personal aspects of life and the music scene as well. So there's a great mix. There's also a lot of affinity from the local culture, people that understand about uh, doing business internationally and specifically with Mexico, because the connection between Texas and Mexico is so strong, similar to California, but there are many other applications and other industries that you know, doing business with Mexico, it's pretty common. It's basically part of your cost structure and business model. So that was something that was encouraging. So Austin was closer to home, was closer to the team and made sense to move here and explore a little bit more and also other aspects. But I think those are the most critical. So yeah, that's the main reason. It's interesting. That makes sense. So let, let's move on. And thank you for that. Uh, tell us about Coba. So you're part of YC. We still don't know what Coba is. Uh, tell us, please. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so Cova is basically a platform supporting contractors in Latin America, starting with Mexico, that earn US dollars and live in pesos, basically. So that means anyone that is working with companies internationally, we help them to get access to the US banking system. We enable different features that it was just available for U.S. citizens before. Now we have some partnerships that allowed us to let these individuals open the accounts, be able to get paid domestically, which is pretty convenient for the company, for the individual. And also we have built some local components, and that's where we feel that we're more competitive, starting with the banking rail to move money from the U.S. to Mexico. So when you think about someone working for... Uh, company based out of Austin and you're living in Mexico City. And this applies for any individual, not just Mexicans, but think about the, let's call it the expats or people moving from the US to Mexico, which is a trend that it's going on right now. One of the main challenges is getting paid and holding those dollars in effectively in dollars and then moving the money to the local currency. So we build the relationships and the rails to be able to move those dollars at the time you decide the amount that you required to any local bank account in Mexico. 
So that's something that our user base is using. And that's one of the pain points that we identified when we started the company. And then we have other local components such as physical card. We have tax support service, which is something that other competitors in the global space are not tackling. They don't care about local markets. They think more about holistically, how can you release a feature that will apply to every jurisdiction and every use case. Our case is different. We think about the pain points of the local market and users and how can we build value add on top of that. So that's a little bit about Koba, maybe a little bit about the history behind. We started this 2019 before even thinking about fintech. We started with a model that was basically connecting talent with companies in the U.S. So we started to identify the opportunity of connecting directly talent and companies. And that was something that was already happening like from, I would say, two decades ago. This is something that has been going on between the U.S. and Mexico. The proximity, the English language affinity. There's many things that help the Mexican market compared to other markets. There's other markets growing, such as Argentina, for example, Dominican Republic, there's many economies in in Latin America that they are getting more connected to the U.S. economy, particularly in tech. But I would say Mexico has a strong position historically. So we started to identify that we wanted to be part of that transactionality happening. And was that we realized having a lot of interviews with individuals, we realized that there was other big challenges and pain points in this equation, which was How can I earn and literally store those earnings in dollars, which is something that years ago was technically impossible because of lack of infrastructure, lack of companies with the appetite to support international clients as well. There's many things that weren't ready years ago. Right now, there's more players that have that appetite to support and provide a service to international clients. So that helped us, but also confirmed that many people in emerging economies are looking to hedge against the local currency because historically, first world countries have stronger currencies. So that was the common question, right? How can I hedge against the local currency? How can I earn, save and spend in dollars? So we started to define the model, look for partnerships, things happen. And we started COVA. That was like the real fintech business that got us into YC was started in 2022. January, we started the year with that. And once that we started building the partnerships, connecting the pieces, we got accepted by YC. We have great support from our partners. Our main partner is Tom Blumfield from Monso. So we're very grateful about that. And yeah, that's how we got into fintech, basically. That's awesome. I mean, so this is the story. I love this kind of story where you start with wanting to connect remote workers, let's say to simplify Mexican workers with U.S. companies, it's not only for Mexicans, but that's, let's say, a big part of it, of the idea. And you realize they have a need. They don't only need to be connected, they actually need financial services. And so you pivot. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the pivot because it's always a difficult situation, I guess. And it's something that a lot of founders are thinking about. Should I be pivoting right now or how to pivot? So I'd like to ask you a question, a couple of questions. First of all, I believe you guys are four co-founders. That's what I see on the YC website. So how do you take decisions, the four of you? It can be the case very easily that it's two against two. What's the decision framework in general? And what's the decision framework to decide to actually pivot? Yeah, well, that's a good one. So yeah, being four founders, it's when you're more than three, it starts to become a challenge, the decision-making process to your point, like what's the framework? So since the very beginning, this is a conversation that I had originally with with Joseph because myself and Joseph have been CEOs of prior companies. But I think that the decision of who's going to be the CEO is really important. It doesn't mean that the rest of the co-founders are not critical in that decision making. But I think first piece is who's going to be the CEO, who's going to have the accountability of riding the boat or sailing in the ocean with the rest of the crew. That's very important. And that was something that everyone decided and agreed. And we're happy with that because when it comes to tough decisions, you know, things that were complicated in in discussions or we didn't have an agreement, it's good to disagree, but we always have to have direction and a path forward. So 
with the clarity of who's going to be the CEO, I think that was very helpful. So I talked to Joseph and we agreed that he was the most capable individual to be the CEO of the company when we started. And I think that was critical. The other aspect is we tried to have at least a founder sync touch point every once uh, a week where we have discussions about critical aspects of the business. And that just helped us to start conversations that were they're living in Slack or emails or, you know, we started the conversation with a partner, but we haven't been able to share thoughts with the rest of the co-founders. So that particular touch point was helpful in order to share what we were thinking about it. For our case, it was a mix between democratic decision-making process where everyone wanted to hear what the other founders were sharing about that particular topic, but also a little bit of, okay, if we're not getting to an agreement in a time frame that we established because what's critical for the business, it depends on the decision, depends on the topic. But for example, something that comes to growth and it was a decision in terms of a partner that knows specific tools or things like that, we said, okay, we need to find this in less than two weeks. And when the two week framework ended, we just said, okay, let's discuss. And that's where if we didn't have a, a definitive answer ourselves, we look at Joseph and we said, okay, what do you think? And we were there to support that decision from him as a leader. But I think it's very important to balance as well, being co-founders, having clarity of what's our role as co-founders of this structure and supporting the, the final decision which I think is very, very important to find that role. And again, I think YC cares a little bit about that when it comes to the interview, you will see because you have 10 minutes, you need to answer all these questions and you need to be well coordinated to answer those who typically, you know, the CEO or the one that is representing the business can become the broker or the one that is addressing those questions and managing who should answer those, you know, so... I don't know if this is the right framework, but it helped us to decide and, and move forward. So hopefully it can help other founders as well. No, that's so fascinating. I mean, you're right. Being four, I guess there's not that many people who are in such a big organization. I mean, you know, there's teams of 20, 100 people, but four at the head, four co-founders. But still, what's really interesting in what you said, I believe, is you found a number one leader. And so if everything else fails, then the number one leader is, okay, you take the final decision and it's in the end, you decide alone. So uh, when there's four people in the end, you decide alone. And so for the pivot specifically, what happened? Were you all agreeing that you needed to pivot? Did some wanted to stay with the old business and then later Joseph had to take the final decision alone? What, what happened there? Yeah, it's a great point. I think we were, as co-founders, we're really excited about the opportunity with the FinTech platform and the challenges that we were hearing from the market. I think that was uh, undeniable, the way that people were talking about the pain points and the appetite to have infrastructure like the one that we have in Cola today. So back in those days when we were making this direct connection, it was a good business, good unit economics, but we started to identify the challenges to scale that model. So thinking about impact and having something that we can scale, we already knew that that was not going to be the business. So when we started to identify this, we said, makes sense to make the pivot. It's a different type of pivot, I would say, in terms of the complexities, because we're speaking about an industry pivot. It's not just the product, which, yeah, you know, you can pivot the product, you can pivot the target market. Those are things that your current infrastructure, legal framework, the org chart might align to those kind of changes. But when you talk about, you know, we're switching industry, we're jumping into other kind of mental model and business model, that's where you need to make adjustments on all the infra that you have built. So first of all, we got excited and we said, okay, this is something that we want to pursue. This is something that we can scale and we can build the impact. The implications of that emerge once that we decided, but in the beginning, we didn't think about it. You know, we thought about the impact. We said, let's make it happen. And we tried to make it happen along the way. So that's what matters. I think you need to be committed. You need to have that conviction of whatever change or payload you're going to make. And it doesn't matter what's going to require to a certain extent. Obviously, there are some aspects that you need to consider, but you have full conviction on that. Just go for it. It's interesting as well. Uh, getting excited. 
there's so many advice on how to pivot, including from YC. But I remember something that I found interesting is if you have a co-founder that leaves, when there's two co-founder and one leaves, or you know, if you're thinking about pivoting, they usually ask the questions, do you still get excited? Are you still excited about the problem that you're trying to solve? And if mm -hmm. you're still excited, maybe you don't need to pivot. If you're more excited about the next thing, so and that's exactly what you said, it's about being excited. So that's, that's really cool. I want to talk more generally about the cross-border payment world. You know, we live in a world that's more and more and more and more connected and more and more and more diverse and people from all around the world work together. You know, people in the U.S. work with people in Asia and Mexico. First of all, how do you think of that world? What do you think are its characteristics? I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're very excited to be on such a booming market, but also, so why did you choose to only restrict it to Mexico and the U.S.? I mean, it, it's mostly, you know, why not? Talk about the, the, the Philippines and, and, I don't know, China, whatever, Asia, or the whole of Latin America. Obviously, you're from Mexico. Maybe some of your co-founders as well. I'm not sure. But why did you choose that market first and to sort of restrict to that market? That's a great question. So, yeah, I'm, I'm originally from Mexico. Three founders originally from Mexico, but trained in the U.S. from our professional experience. So, the other co-founder, he's originally from the U.S., but as a family in Mexico. So, you know, there's some connections there. I would say that for our case, we have enough data points and information to confirm that there was a huge opportunity in the corridor between the U.S. and Mexico that was enough at the beginning to start testing and prove what we wanted to validate. And when we started to build the product and validate this with users, we realized that being local and building local features to solve local problems was meaningful to our target persona. And the world companies that were solving partial pain points of these individuals were not doing the best job at it. It's a big gap to solve those other pain points that this type of individuals are facing. So we saw that there was it was an exciting opportunity, but because of the local component, we said, okay, let's start local, let's build local and penetrate those local economies before thinking about expanding globally. I do believe that, for example, and this is just the case of Mexico and the US, you have NAFTA, for example, the NAFTA agreement, which has many, many benefits. For example, there's a tax benefit because of that agreement that benefits individuals and companies transacting between the two economies. You have some type of visas even Canadians can use because they're part of the agreement, but it helps a lot to move the economy forward. So I think particularly in that region, in that corridor, when you think about global partnerships, political landscape, economic connections, every region is different. I think there's a huge opportunity when you start thinking about those corridors and those regions. You were mentioning Asia, for example. You can think about Asia, you know, between India and UK, there's a lot of transactionality, remittances is a big market, Singapore and India as well. Also, Southeast Asia economy is well connected with the American economy in specific disciplines or roles. I, I would say that's a huge opportunity as well. But again, in our case, we identified that being local and understanding the local problems will help us to be more competitive. That's what we're doing. We're trying to solve those local problems. I think there's compelling cases of companies that can rapidly deploy a feature or a set of features and products to different countries. For sure, that's an opportunity, but depends on the use case. It also depends on if it's sustainable, if it's 1 billion market, what's the time? I mean, there, there's a lot of questions that needs to be answered. But in our case, I think it, it made sense. And, you know, when you see the transactionality just between Texas and the U.S., it's in the billions. When you see the U.S. and Mexico, not just the consumer, but also the businesses, it's in the billions, almost trillions. So there's a lot of connections and a lot of gaps and a lot of opportunities in different aspects, not just fintech, but also logistics, you know, manufacturing and so on. It's interesting because there's almost 130 million people in Mexico. I think it's 127, 129. It's going to be 130. And so it's only quote unquote Mexico, but it's actually a pretty big market and there's even more Americans. Is it 
following Paul Graham's advice, do things that don't scale. Like if you're talking to everyone, you're talking to no one. But if you're talking to Mexicans, then you can really, like you said, go local and be very useful for the Mexican population. Is this what inspired you to start like this? Yeah, I think part of it is what YC and PG talks about, do things that don't scale. I think that's great advice because you want to start building something where you have your user, your client in front of you. You want to talk to them. You want to understand what drives them, their behavior. So I think that's very useful. That's meaningful. And yeah, it helps and adds to what we are building today. Along the way, and I would say this is part of the outcomes of having your users pretty close to you. But even though you have a defined persona and you're looking for those type of clients, your product might apply to different contexts. And this is on the scenario of almost PMF or, you know, pre-PMF. Even if you are product market fit, it might be the, the scenario as well where you have a product and users, clients might use your product in a different way that you talk. And that's interesting because... If you're building something, thinking about one persona, of course, you will build something they want to use. Then you talk to 100 people and you have them on, you know, groups in WhatsApp or you have them on this Slack channel or whatever. You will understand what drives them, what motivates them. But then again, your product will be so consolidated, tailored and specific to that use case that you won't imagine that someone else will look for that solution. And that's something that, you know, 12 months ahead of our launch in, in production, when we were in YC, we started to realize that there are different applications of our infrastructure. To your point about Mexico, right? So we started with Mexico, but that's the Mexican population. But if you deep dive, you see different segments, right? And I was speaking prior to the case of Americans moving to Mexico. There's almost 1 million Americans with national identity documents, with all the paperwork to be legally in Mexico. And these type of personas are having challenges to get access to the Mexican banking system and moving their funds to Mexico. And this is something that we have discussed. Probably it's something that we want to explore in terms of expanding our applications of the platform. But I think it's It comes from the fact that we were just focused on one market, on one specific set of needs. And then along the way, okay, there's some needs that fit into other criteria, into other uh, user segment. And then the other way around, like we started with Mexico, but when you think about the U.S. economy and Mexicans moving to the U.S. and having, you know, assets and family in Mexico, and I'm not speaking about the old way of the way that remittances used to work decades ago. We're talking about people that are moving to the U.S. to start businesses, explore different opportunities. Uh, we're talking about 10 million people. So the transactionality between the two countries to enable individuals to move funds between two currencies, it's a real pain point. And again, there's dependencies on that, like the fiscal aspects, legal aspects. How can you solve land to both economies? If you have money there, how can you save and have some interest rates? There's many things that you can explore. So yeah, back to your point. Love the advice of building something, thinking about just one user, building something that doesn't scale because eventually will scale. And once that you build this foundation, you are building the foundation to scalability. So I totally agree with that advice. Yeah, that's what it is. It's do things that don't scale, not forever, Until you reach PMF and then you can scale. Um, I'd like to ask you about crypto because obviously there might be some listeners thinking about this as well. I'm guessing crypto is one of your biggest competitor or at least people might be thinking, wait a minute, why do we need Koba? We can just do cross-border with crypto. So is it a competitor? Are you using it? Just what's your thinking around crypto? Yeah, well, first of all, here at Koba, we're big fans of crypto and what the wave of Web 3.0 and blockchain will bring to this industry. So we're open and continuously exploring infrastructure that we can incorporate to our business. I think what I can share about crypto and our model is what I heard on Consensus this year during uh, it happened in Austin. It's a big crypto conference that it's getting bigger and bigger. And one of the things that I heard on one of the talks was the infrastructure is there. Nobody cares about building more blocks that will enable someone to, you know, switch between one cryptocurrency to another or having more wallets. 
It's about the use case. So there's compelling cases where crypto solves the problem of certain use cases pretty well. And back to the point about Latin America, we've seen great tools being used in Argentina, for example, where the local market doesn't trust the banking system. 50% of the population, at least in technology and software, are connected to the U.S. economy. So there's appetite to earning the dollars. And there's the blue market where, you know, you cannot get access to the mid-market rates of the Argentina peso against the dollar. It's way under. So there's tools that are connecting the U.S. economy with the Argentinian market in different ways where crypto, it's uh, basically that tool because the banking system is very different and people don't trust in that. So I think that's a case where you definitely need to use crypto. There's no other way. For the case of our corridor, for example, it's interesting because we can make settlement. So think about someone that holds US dollars and want to send uh, those dollars into pesos. The funds flow that we have enable our users to make settlement in just two or three seconds. No kidding. Like we've seen other applications where it takes more time with crypto because you need to build, you know, the hash and then you need to confirm with some partners. You, you might have two or three tiers where you need to confirm the transaction. Obviously, there are other benefits to that. But if you need the money right away, you're making a transaction right now on the retail store or you want to send money to someone because you're in the middle of a conversation or just certainty, right? Like our rails work 24-7. So you want certainty of having those funds available. We can make it happen. And fortunately, the market in Mexico, the banking system, at least the market trust and relies on that. And we realized that back in the pandemic when some crypto companies had some real challenges and many of the population were looking for other solutions. Speaking of people that were already using this type of technologies. So I think depends on the use case. For us, we see different use cases in this market where we can use crypto, where, you know, might be a little bit expensive, but if the user is willing to pay for that, why not? So, yeah, I think, I mean, we, we have the vision that eventually we will integrate something about crypto for sure. So depends on the case, depends on the on the market and, and your use case. I think it's it's definitely an option for sure. Cool. That's awesome. I want to ask you about YC and your experience there. You started in 2019, but you only went through YC in 2022 after the pivot. So Unlike most startups, they go through YC when they're very, very, very young. There is no good or bad habits. It's very easy to mold them on the YC style. But for you, it was different. You already have four co-founders, three years of existence. How was your experience with YC? Was it different? Was it difficult to adapt to the YC style? Just a, a, a quick thing there. We joined in 2023 and we formally started the business in 2022. So you can think about 2019 was exploratory. Everyone was doing something on their own. So formally, we started 2022. Now, to your point, you're right. I mean, there's data that highlights that there's younger founders in accelerators like YC. And it makes sense. I mean, you have more things to risk, right? When you're older, maybe you have family, you have children, you have other dependencies but we found like, I mean, 30% are people over 32 or 33, I think is wow. the age. So yeah, so I mean, the threshold is like 70% are people younger. So if you think about it, yeah, probably you're starting your business from scratch. You haven't spent more than one, two months. Building a product like ours took these all months just to have the relationships, the partnerships. We did a pre-seed round. So, I mean, it's an industry that requires money. That's for sure. So I think every industry is different. Every product will be different. And if you have a different configuration within that industry product, obviously might benefit or might be a different thing to navigate. But I think what I can share with the audience is that you don't need to be someone graduating from Stanford or one of the Ivy Leagues. There's an opportunity for founders that are building things and are not part of that group. And I think that was part of the case of a couple of my founders. We have built businesses. We didn't come from the Ivy League schools or any remarkable university, but we were building and we were following the advice that YC gave to anyone. 
we were trying to do things that people want. So I think if you focus and you build with that mantra in mind, eventually you will find something that excites you, something that it's the right product or the right market. And I mean, I was building something before for 12 years. So again, the, the accelerator is great. Not for every founder would be a, a great fit. I need to highlight that. But it's definitely, it's a great accelerator. I don't know if the best accelerator that you can have as a startup founder. And it was a great experience, to be honest. Like once that we got accepted and you realize that you're not the youngest, you get into the mindset of getting all the advice and meeting people, enjoying the time in San Francisco. And the partners that we had were amazing. That's something that I think is few accelerators can talk about it, meaning people that have truly built businesses and can provide advice based on that experience, you know, empiric advice. So I think YC has a, a very strong muscle in that sense. So every partner that you will talk to will have experience of building companies, exiting those businesses, facing challenges that probably you're facing today and how to avoid them or what was the framework of thinking when they faced that decision. So I would advise anyone to try to apply either, you know, summer or winter. I think regardless of the time of the year, it would be a great experience, but definitely an accelerator. So, yeah. That's absolutely awesome. I, I love that very, very much. Um, we're nearing the, the end of our time together and thank you so much already, but uh, a couple more questions for you. I wanted to ask you, what is something in the future of Koba that you're really excited about What's coming for Koba that you can talk to us about and that really gets you excited? Yeah, I'm really excited about these use cases that I was sharing with you, Gabriel. Different applications of the infrastructure that we have to serve other personas, other people. That's exciting because that's something that we didn't have in the map originally, but now we realize that people are looking for this kind of solution. So I'm really excited about that. Excited about the growth that we can get from exploring those different applications and also excited about other features that we're building. Right now, it's, it's just, well, it is not just, but it, the main component is the U.S. bank account for individuals outside of the U.S. And we're targeting Mexicans. But I'm really excited about thinking, you know, different funds flow for, you know, people that want to effectively save in dollars, like enabling those funds flow that they can send pesos into U.S. dollars we're also in conversations to allow our uh, user base to be able to get an interest rate on the money that they are holding in their U.S. bank account as well, which effectively will be in dollars in the U.S. economy. And we're speaking with other partners to have the availability of different vehicles, meaning portfolios of investment. So we're thinking about ways that Mexico and other markets can have the opportunity to invest and put their money in, into the strongest economy in the world. And the other thing that we're excited about is, well, the journey itself. Uh, you know, I, I think if I, I didn't say that, I would be, you know, like not motivated, but I, I'm really excited and looking forward to what comes next, what tomorrow will bring. And nobody knows what will happen tomorrow, but I'm open to explore and, and, and keep building. So that's something that keeps me alive. And also hearing about our user base, the customers, that they're excited about the product, that's literally fuel for us. So really excited for that. That's a great mentality to have. You know, I don't know what tomorrow is made of, but I'm optimistic and I want to keep building. I wish everyone on earth had the same mentality. Before we wrap up, I ask this question to all of my guests. Is there a quote or a book that had a significant impact on your life that you can share with us? Yeah, of course. So I'll share two. If you don't mind. So, That's okay. Yeah, we, we talked about PG, but this, this was something before I got into YC and I read this book, I think. That's cool. Yeah, really good one. And the other one, and this is more for my fellow computer scientists and PMs, product people, The Mythical Man Hunt. I love it. Um, this is from Frederick Brooks, which is the... He was the PM at the IBM 360 operating system back in the 70s. So when you read the book and you you see all the challenges that they had while building software, we're not that different right now. 2020, same challenges, 
same issues of coordinating multiple people. And when you think about founders and startups, I think the best way to solve this thing is having touch points, having multiple moments where you can discuss about the strategy, the product. That helps to build conviction. That helps to solve things and, and problems that are happening. And also reminding each other why we're building this. So those two are my recommendations. That's awesome. I love it. Eduardo, thank you so much for sharing your insights and being here. Before we wrap up, could you tell our listeners when they can find you online and learn more about you and about Koba? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can find more about Koba at Koba, C-O-V-A dot A-I. We're in the stores, but that's our website. And you can find myself on X at Edo Lopez and Instagram as well, edolopez.io. And that's my website, edolopez.io. Uh, thanks so much. It was a, a great chat, Gabriel. I really enjoyed it. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Again, I had a great time. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to the Lobster Talks. Don't forget to subscribe for more conversations like this. And please don't forget to rate us and leave a review or comment on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time on the Lobster Talks, stay bold, stay curious, and remember, those big ideas start somewhere.